good, good father. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard a thunder whisper of love the dead of night you tell me that your reason that I'm never Let's pray as we get ready to open God's word this morning. God, we thank you for the book of life, God, your guidebook. As we get ready to dig into your holy word, God, just speak to us, allow your Holy Spirit to roam amongst us. As it already dwells inside us, Lord, reveal to us what you want us to know this morning. Speak to us each as individuals. 
Again, Lord, we love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to talk about God's love this morning. If you take your Bible this morning and open up to 1 John, that's where we're going to start. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16. We've had a lot of negative news here lately with the virus and different things going on in our world, but I want us to take the good news, the best news of all, and that's God's love, and just dwell on it this morning and think about it as God speaks to us. St. Augustine said, God loves each of us as if there were only one of us. I want you to think about that. God loves you so very, very much. It's hard to even describe the depths of God's love for each and every one of us. And I want you to think about the goodness of God this morning. And just think about what God has done for you in your life. Salvation being one of them, and we'll talk about that as we go through God's love this morning. But just think about the blessings that God has bestowed upon each and every single one of us. The breath of life that you get every day, for one. You know, God could choose to take any one of us home at any time. But each one of us here this morning, God has given another day up to this point. God loves us so much. He created you in his image. I mean, God created us spiritually in his image. Oh, the depth of God's love. 1 John 4.16 says this. And we have known... And believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. There's a lot said in that verse. First of all, it says, we have known and believed the love that God has for us. Do you believe that? Do you honestly believe in the depths of your, in your heart and in your mind that God has a great love for you. It says we have known and believed the love that God has for us. I, I believe it. I know it. I just look around and see what God has done, and there is no doubt God loves me and God loves you. Look at what it says next there. God is love. We don't even know what love is unless we think about God. Because it says here, God is love. There is no such thing as love outside of knowing God and his love for us. We have to understand that before we can understand any other kind of love. God created you in his image because he loves you. Oh, the depth of God's love for us. God is love. And then it goes on to say, and he who abides in love, if any of us dwells in love, if any of us abides in love, we have to abide in God. I want you to think about what that's saying. That's basically telling us that if we truly are able to love others, we must first abide in God. In other words, we can't share the, the, the true love that God has for us with others unless we have that personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ ourselves. Think about what that says. So everybody outside and people say, well, that, that's crazy. People can love others without God. I didn't say that. I, I said that we can't love as God loves us. We can't love others in the way that God loves unless we first abide in God and have that personal relationship. There is a love outside of God but it's not the kind of love that God has and that God wants us to have for others. We first have to have that personal relationship. He who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Do you have that personal relationship? All of us need to, to make sure that we have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ because that's true love. That's the true love that God sent to us was Jesus and showed his love. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. C.S. Lewis said, though our feelings come and go, God's love for us does not. I want you to remember that quote because there's times in our lives where we may sin against God or fail God. And sometimes we think, well, I've done this or that, so God must not love me anymore. That's not, that's not true. God loves us. God cares about us. 
God's love never goes away. And as I was thinking about that this week, I was thinking, well, what about the person that has rejected God and will be judged one day to go to hell? Does God not love that person? <coughs> no. God does love that person, and God has provided salvation for that person, but that person has rejected Jesus and thus will reap the consequences that God set up because he's a holy God and he can't dwell with sin. That person rejected God's salvation plan of Jesus Christ, he still loves that person. I believe he loves every person that's going to end up in hell. But they chose to reject him and reap the consequences. God loves everybody, and we can't do anything to get outside of God's love. Now, he's not pleased with some of the choices we make and the, and the sins that we do, and there's repercussions from sin and the consequences of sin, but he still loves us just like a parent. When, you're, when your child does something that is wrong or and, and deserves punishment? Do you quit loving your child because they did something wrong? No, we still love them. But they have to reap the consequences of whatever they did. That's the same with God. Franklin Graham says, No matter what storm you face, you need to know that God loves you. He has not abandoned you. And I think that's relevant for the time that we're in with this coronavirus storm that we're, we're getting through. We need to know... God loves us. He cares about us. He has not abandoned us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. That is one of the promises that he gives us in his word. If you take your Bibles and flip over to Romans. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39. Now remember this about God does not abandon us. Romans 8, 35 through 39 says... Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or pearl, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what does that tell us? What can separate us from the love of God? What, how will God abandon us? This tells us nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, no matter what comes our way. And in verse 36, it was talking about, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter, talking about in our service to God. We may uh, meet some kind of persecution in our service to God. I read a lot about missionaries here lately going overseas and going to heathen tribes and losing their lives in service to God. Well, it's telling us here, even though we're sheep out there for the slaughter, they're not going to separate us from the love of God. Because why were those people even out there sharing to these heathen tribes who uh, a lot of them were uh, cannibals? Why were they out there? To share the gospel, to share the love of God with them. And so if they lost their lives by serving God this way, it still didn't separate them from the love of God. It just showed their love for God, that they were willing to sacrifice themselves to bring the love of God to others. What are we willing to do in our love for God, knowing that everybody needs the gospel? What are we willing to do to go out and knock on our neighbor's door, knock on other people's doors, whatever it is, share with our co-worker, whatever it is, are we willing to step out in faith because of our love for God and our love for salvation that he has provided us to bring it to others? That's part of how we show our love for God, that we care about others created in his image and share the good news of Jesus Christ. God will not abandon us, no matter what. So that brings us, do we love others? Do we really love others? God loves us. Somebody has brought the gospel to us at some point so that we could give our lives to Jesus Christ. Do we love others? God loves us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 through 11 says this. 
In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his only son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love God one another. What he's saying here is it's not really that we love God, it's that God loved us. That's the, that's the major point. God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to be the payment for our sins. And thus, if there's nothing else but that fact right there, that God sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for our sins, we ought to love God immensely. If he didn't give us one other blessing, if he didn't put food on our tables, clothes on our back, a roof over our head, or whatever other blessing you want to throw in there, if that was the only thing that God ever did for us, is send his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins so that we can have eternal life with Jesus forever in heaven, forever and ever and ever, we ought to love God immensely. He's provided us eternal life so that we can live with him. In heaven forever and ever and ever. And so it goes on to say, if God so loved us in that manner that he was willing to give his only son for us, we also ought to love one another. What are we willing to do for other folks? If God was willing to do that for us, what are we willing to do for those lost and undone without Jesus? We need to be reaching out. If we love him, he expects us to love others. That's a key uh, point taught in scriptures. If he loves us and we love him, we have to love others. Matter of fact, he goes on to say, doesn't he? Something even beyond just loving our neighbor, loving our co-workers. He says we even have to what? Love our enemies. Love our enemies. And it doesn't get any harder than that doesn't get any harder than that. Reach out to those we don't even care for. Jesus showed us his love time and time again. And we hear about it all the time and we can't hear it enough. In John 15, 13, we see how Jesus showed us his love. It says, greater love has no one than this. And these are the words of Jesus himself. Than to lay down one's life for his friend. We have no greater love to show the world than for us to lay our lives down for others. Are we willing to do that? Go away from our enjoyments, go away from time with our family, whatever you want to put in there. Are you willing to lay down your life for your friends, or for your coworkers, or even for your enemies to share the good news of Jesus Christ? Do we, do we really understand that if a person dies without a relationship with Jesus Christ, that they will go to hell. Do we really understand that? I think sometimes we get so caught up in life and we hear so many different philosophies out there now. Oh, John is a great person. Oh, he's, he's a good guy. No, he didn't go to church and no, he didn't trust Jesus as the Lord and Savior, but gosh, he helped his neighbor and, and you know, he did all these good things. That's wonderful. But the Bible says there's only one way to heaven, and that is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Repenting of your sins, trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and living with him as being Lord of your life. Everything else, everything else, if you don't have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, leads to hell. That's not fun to say. That's not a good thing to think about. But that's truth, and that's why we have to have an urgency of sharing the gospel with all that we can. We've got to get that urgency back. <coughs> Romans 5, 8. Look at that verse with me. Romans 5, 8 says this. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So 
verse that we all need to keep in our minds as well that you know Jesus didn't die for us when we were pretty good folks and our, we've changed our lives and all kinds of things. It said while we were still sinners, because we're all sinners in the sight of God, the only thing that keeps us, that turns us from our sins in the eyes of God is that shed blood of Jesus Christ covering us. We're all sinners, and that's why Jesus Christ died for us. Billy Graham said, God proved his love on the cross. When Christ hung and bled and died, it was God saying to the world, I love you. I love you. As Jesus, that picture of Jesus hanging on that cross, bloodied and beaten and uh, scarred up and beard pulled out for you and I. The reason he was there for you and I, as he was hanging there, that was Jesus saying to the world, I love you and I'm willing to die for you. When we know the love of Jesus, then and only then are we filled with the fullness of God. When we know the love of Jesus, then and only then are we filled with the fullness of God. We've got to understand that because we don't have the fullness of God and what God wants for us until we know the love of Jesus. In the book of Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter 3 it says this, verse 17, verse ch chapter 3, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. In other words, we've got to believe in Christ, and he dwells in this heart of ours through the faith that we have in him. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Are you filled with the love of God? Are you filled with all that God wants for you? Remember what it says here. It says <clears throat> that you're able to comprehend through faith, through love, with all the saints, the width and the length and depth and height to know the love of Christ. Which he says passes knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. We are not filled with everything that God has for us until we get to pass the first point, And that's the love of Christ. Of what God has done for us. When we understand that point, then we can start gaining the fullness of the joy that we need to have it. That Christ died for us and that we're living for him. We're breathing him. We're serving him. We're obeying him. All that he's called us to do. Then we start to live with the fullness that God has for each and every one of us. All he wants for us, all he has for us, can only be fulfilled through knowing the love that Christ has for each and every one of us. And living that out in our lives. I pray that we all understand that, that true life is only had in knowing Jesus and serving Jesus with every ounce of our being. Because that's what we're made for, to serve God, to worship God, to have a relationship with God. That's what he made us for. Everything outside of that is just bonuses. But we're made here to serve, love, and and obey God. That's what we're here for. That's why he created us. Henry Blackaby said, If you know that God loves you, you should never question a, di a directive from him. It is always best and right. When he gives you a directive, which usually comes from right here, usually comes from his word or something he reveals to you in prayer. When he gives you a directive, you are not just to observe it, discuss it, or debate it. You are to obey it. So let us ask ourselves, are we obeying the word of God? And to obey the word of God, we have to know the word of God. And to know the word of God, we need to be in it often, frequently, and soaking it in our minds and in our hearts. 
And then we, we don't question the word of God. It's got to where many folks, even those who claim to be followers of, of God, followers of Jesus, think they can debate and question what's in the word of God. No, this is absolute truth. This is final authority. What God's word says is the way it is and the way we're to live. There's no debating it, no tearing out a page here or there and rewriting it for what we think or what we want to hear. It's God's word. We do what it says. This is the guidebook. Galatians 2.20 says this. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. This is for any believer who's put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We've been crucified with Christ. In other words, we have died just like Christ has. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In other words, we give him authority to have all rule over our life. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. It's saying, now as I'm living my life, everything I do comes from my faith in Jesus Christ. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Why? Does Christ have that hold over my life? Because he gave himself in my place to take my sins upon the cross. It says he bought me. In another place in the word of God it says he bought us. He died on the cross and we now live for him because he died for us. Because Jesus loves us. Remember, Jesus, God, loves us and gave himself for for you and for me, he desires total devotion. One last verse I want to share with you this morning. Found in Psalms. I already have it wrote down. It says, Psalm 136 and verse 26 says, Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. God's steadfast love for you and for me will endure forever and ever and ever and we can just keep going on and on and on as far as we want to want to go keep saying forever eternally god loves you remember that god loves you and so let's give our all in return back to god for he alone is worthy let's pray god thank you for allowing us to gather here this morning to break open the word. God, I pray that you spoke to us this morning, and Lord, that we were ready to receive whatever it is that you had for each one of us individually. Lord, if there's something on our heart that we need to move about, something you're convicting us of, this altar is always open. God, bring one, bring all, whatever it is. But God, I pray that we realize how much you love us, what you've done for us in giving your only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. God, may we be obedient to your word. May we live your word out each and every day and not let's just let it go in one ear and out the other. But God, you have a desire for your children to serve you and to obey you and share, to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. Lord, move us as you see fit this morning. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.